Thank you so much, Jim, and welcome to everyone who's here physically with us at the Boston Public Library tonight, and also those who are at home with us on Facebook, Twitter, and on YouTube. So I'm delighted to have uh, Dr. Rosabeth Moss Cantor here tonight to talk about her amazing new book uh, called Think Outside the Building, which I ripped through over the weekend. Um, and it was very insightful. But first, I just want to introduce uh, Rosabeth uh, to those who may not know all of her amazing accomplishments. She's currently a professor at Harvard Business School specializing in strategy, innovation, and leadership for change, which is exactly what we're going to focus on this evening. She also founded the Harvard University-wide Advanced Leadership Initiative, of which we have some alumni in the room with us tonight. Dr. Cantor is the former chief editor of the Harvard Business Review and has authored more than 20 books, the most recent of which is the one we're gonna discuss tonight. She's the recipient of numerous national and international leadership awards, including the Chamber's Pinnacle Awards for Lifetime Achievement, and we are clearly in great company here tonight. Uh, just one more note before we start, we'll take audience questions during uh, this program. Please use the note cards and um, that are scattered throughout the room. Linda, who's waving them around right now, will get them to you. And also, I just want to note that Rosabeth will be signing books in the back at the end of the program as well. So welcome. Thank you. My pleasure. Why this book now? Tell us. Um, so we are living in perilous times. Mm -hmm. um, we have so many issues that have not been resolved over the years. Um, and it's about time that we have leaders step up to the challenge. And it's got to be all of us. So, um, you know, it's got, we, I care about gender issues, racial disparities, climate change is a really big one, especially for millennials, gun violence. I mean, name your issue. In fact, they were named 50 years ago, and yet we still haven't resolved them. And so the question is, why? I mean, that says we can't resolve them using the same old methods. We need innovative solutions. We need people with fresh ideas who think differently. And your book really is a roadmap for leaders, sort of next-gen leaders who want to figure out how to solve the biggest problems of our time, you know, world hunger, uh, climate change, as you mentioned, right? Yeah. And so can you give us a few of yeah. the sort of the, the high-level um, ideas that have emerged in this book for you? Yeah, well, first of all, it's not just next-gen mm -hmm. leaders, although I really care about them, and entrepreneurs. Social impact mm -hmm. is now one of the hottest topics of our time. Right. First of all, because everybody wants to be a good guy, and established companies want to make sure that they're not, mm -hmm. their reputation isn't being damaged. But also, we have this huge demographic. We have all kinds of people, baby boomers, who are living 20, 30, even more years after the time they leave their companies. And they want to do good. They're an incredible force of change. So how you mobilize people to do the change, first of all, people have to believe in a purpose larger than themselves. Mm -hmm. It can't be all about you. Success is important, but it's also important to think about who you're bringing that success to, how it's making a difference in the world. And there's a rising tide of people who actually actively care about that. Mm -hmm. um, it's really next-gen leadership, right, as opposed to leaders. Um, but also, it seems like there are lessons in this book for people at any stage of their career, right? I loved um, one of the uh, concepts, one of the metaphors at the beginning of the book uh, talks about um, how you can't attack the, the castle head-on. And that, um, talk a little bit about that. I loved the, the, the very visual language that you employed, sort of talking about you can have a little picnic outside the castle and make people interested in wanting to come out and greet you, right? As opposed to um, greeting you with bows and arrows. That's a better way yeah. to attack the castle. That's right. I mean, I, in a sense, this book is talking about significant change, and yet I provide a lot of tips for doing it in a way that doesn't raise the defenses. And one way is to innovate, is to create something exciting and new that draws people to you and that begins to change the conversation. Mm -hmm. And there are people now changing the conversation all over America, and I honor them in the book. I tell their stories. I tell the story, for example, of the former president of Trader Joe's, who has these, this fantastic new retail concept right here in Boston. Right that is um, providing affordable nutrition for the poor by solving an environmental problem, which is wasted food. Right. And so that's an imaginative 
new way of doing things. But he also, uh, that's Doug Rauch, mm -hmm. right? Doug Rau. And yeah. Rau, thank you. Um, he had to uh, really take a leap of faith with himself to leave Trader Joe's to do that work, right? And so there's uh, inspiration for people who are already leaders who maybe feel like the work that they're doing day in, day out does not align with their personal passion or that they think they can do even more. That's a hard decision to make. It's a hard decision. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm now thinking this is the new male midlife crisis. <laughs> I think for women, I mean, the male midlife crisis, instead of getting a Porsche, mm -hmm. you get a social impact goal. Um, you may still get the, the car. For women, I think women have always seemed more socially concerned, but also any of us. I mean, I've cared a lot about advancing women in leadership. And I think in the case of women, women are now increasingly at the table um, in many organizations, but not necessarily at, at the stage where they can have impact, where they can state a big vision, have a big dream. So that's hard to do. I mean, it's a lot easier to go along with where your career takes you, to put your head down and do the work. Mm -hmm. But what really produces the kind of leadership that I'm talking about, and now I see what you meant by next gen, I mean an advanced stage of leadership. Okay. What, what really produces that is having a passion about something and a dream that's big enough you hang on to it. It gives you purpose and meaning even in the messy middles of change mm -hmm. when you think everything looks like a failure, right. you keep on going. Mm -hmm. Well, let's pause on the book for a moment and just go back to uh, you know, the beginning of your focus on leadership um, as a subject matter. Um, tell us why you focused on that and still focus on that, and it has taken many iterations over the years. Yeah, well, it depends on what you call what I do, mm -hmm. because I actually cared about fixing the world. There's a big world to fix, mm. and so who's gonna do it? It doesn't get better by itself. Right. In fact, there are people who wanna make it worse, and so I've always had an emphasis on the end goal and not so much on just being a leader per se. And so first I had to make clear that people like me, which meant women, mm -hmm. were capable of doing that and I needed to encourage and inspire more to do that. I had to understand the barriers, so that was an important thing I did. Then I had to um, get people involved in more innovation and entrepreneurship because that's the way you get change, thinking right. differently, not by doing it the same old way. So throughout the years, I have helped many organizations, many people, many companies, but I've always been back to this goal of what is going to improve the state of the world and how do we give people the tools and the motivation and the will to do mm -hmm. that. And so that's what we were doing at Harvard. And it's amazing some of what inspires people. I tell the story of a couple in Washington, D.C. that took personally the Syrian refugee crisis. They had no personal um, stake in it right. one way or another, but they wanted to do something and they found a new pathway, kind of building something a little like Uber, matching people with talent in those refugee camps with companies that needed employees. Wow. And that was a very big idea. And it's a whole new pathway mm -hmm. for solving a huge humanitarian crisis. And so I love that kind of innovative thinking and I know in Boston, we're the source of a great deal sure. of it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I want to just encourage questions from the audience here, or if you're online, you can tweet them at us at WDBH or on our Facebook page as well. Um, you mentioned uh, lots of different ways that you know people can make the leap to a, uh, from a big idea to reality. Um, in your book, you talk about a few ways that, that you can help leaders break out. One was, um, you call them bridges, clubs, ashrams, and boards. I thought that those yeah. were really interesting. Talk about those. Well, thank you. So first of all, people who are successful sometimes get trapped in their very success. I mean, they talk to other people right. who think the same way. They want to use the tools of their profession mm -hmm. everywhere. And those big, messy problems that surround them, even if they're still in their company and want to do more, those big, messy problems can't be solved, I've said this, at, with the same old ways of doing right. it. So you have to break out of these narrow ways of thinking. And so you need to get out of the building, so to speak, <laughs> and get out to the streets. You can think you have a solution, but if you don't actually <laughs> yeah, talk to people in the community and understand it from their point of view, 
you're too insular, your idea won't work. Whether your idea is a business innovation or it's a social purpose, change the world innovation. So you have to get out. And so I think one of the bridges actually is boards. If you're on a board that puts you together with people who are different, now that's hard to do too mm -hmm. because boards have been way too homogeneous. That's why we need to diversify them. You get together with people who give you a different perspective in a different industry and again, maybe out in the community. Um, the second is clubs. You know, you're in a club when you're successful. Not just that you get to eat lunch at a club, as I've been doing on my book tour, but that you are with like-minded peers and you spend a lot of time convincing each other that your way of doing things is just fine. Why do those other people attack us who are the castle? And so what you need is a new club. You need to be connected to people who have the same social purpose goals you do, and you can find them. I mean, I'm now thinking of all the people interested in this who do it in isolation as a kind of army of democracy. Right. You know, they're the people who are going to bring about change and, and um, I don't want to say make America great again, but that are going to restore the principles of involvement and democracy through participation. And then you need the ashram part is a little time for reflection. Because if you jump in too fast, like Doug Rao's first idea was he would find, he was a logistics guy at Trader Joe's, and he would find a more efficient way to deliver used bread, day-old bread from supermarkets, which was kind of a stale idea, if you think <laughs> about it. No pun intended. Um, yeah, um, absolutely. I intended it. And um, <laughs> it, was, it was not his, that was his first idea. If you go with your first idea and don't reflect and don't explore, you don't come up with something as unique and innovative as Daily Table. Great. We have a couple of questions here from the audience. The first one says, should you ever tell a person her idea is bad or won't work? And if so, do you do it? Oh, I, t I tell people all the time, you've got to change that idea. I don't actually, I'll say, you know, in that form it might not work, but we don't, I don't necessarily say it's a bad idea because one of my principles is that um, Cantor's Law, I call it, name my own law, everything can look like a failure in the middle. Right. And if you persevere, yeah. if you tweak it. Um, but you'd have to be realistic too. I mean, great ideas, um, need to have some demonstration that it will actually work. And I think also a revenue model, that somebody will care about this enough that they will invest in it. Mm -hmm. You talk about that uh, messy middle in your book, and there are also some ways to sort of break out of that. Can you just talk about that for a moment? Um, yes, well, everything can look like a failure in the middle because you build a set of allies and then some of them get sick and they're not there anymore. Or you face a crisis that you didn't know was there, like coronavirus may be disrupting an awful lot of things besides cruise ships off the coast of Japan. Um, and so there are so many unexpected obstacles when you start to do something new and different that you have to be able to persevere and persist and tweak it and go back to your allies and remember the purpose. Uh, remember that it's about something larger and even if it's uncomfortable right now, we keep on going. Absolutely. Another question from the audience is, which leader in history would you enjoy talking with in person? Oh my gosh, there are so many people. I love that idea, I love that question. But um, in history, I mean, but one of the people that I admire greatly, I mean, there are a lot of people I'd like to talk to. One of the, and of course you've written a book about one of them who helped women get the vote. But I would like to, I wish Nelson Mandela were mm. still here. I mean, I did have the privilege of meeting him once. Mm. And talk about persistence and perseverance. That's why he came to mind. Yeah. Because he was in prison for 27 years before he came out and became president of South Africa, first democratically elected president. And so whenever I hear people say, I can't possibly stick with it. I say, find your inner Mandela. Right. <laughs> we have another question from the audience. Uh, one of, uh, and the, the question says, this is from Kate, and she says, one of the topics I teach my client as a coach is to give themselves permission to lead, and that leadership looks different, looks like many different things. Instead of the belief that they have to follow rules to lead and innovate, what are your thoughts? 
Well, certainly there are many different styles, many different ways to do that. And if you're innovating, remember that you're also being a little different in your idea. And so then it's a good idea, I think, if you have a really fresh and new idea, it's a good idea to obey the rules in nearly everything else. You don't want to try to change everything at once. Mm -hmm. That's way too radical. We're seeing it even in the political campaigns. Mm -hmm. Way too radical starts turning people off. You want to take the one thing you care about and then um, push that idea, but still try to, I want to say, conform or obey the rules in nearly everything else and try to use the accepted process. I tell a story in the book about a very radical education idea. It's the six-year high school. Mm -hmm. We're talking here in Boston about, um, about early college high school, but it's been now being done across the country, starting in New York, and that's a pretty radical idea. The public schools, um, K through 12, with community colleges, with an employer partner, but they didn't try to change absolutely everything. They didn't, they used the existing teaching structure, so they didn't try to change the unions. Right. They used the principal selection process. So if you have, you're trying to do something really different, don't undermine it with too many side issues that you also have to argue about. Mm, good point. Um, one last uh, sort of uh, anecdote from the book that I found really interesting. Uh, obviously, you wrote this book a while ago before we knew that Mike Bloomberg would be running for president. Um, but you talk about um, Bloomberg um, sort of focusing at the highest level on transformative change. I mean, for him, of course, it was cities, how to transform cities, right? But also focused on issues like those big intractable issues like gun control and... Um, and you know poverty and so forth. Can you just talk a little bit about what those qualities are or how he in particular has been able to dial in to try to solve not just one but several of those big gnarly changes? So he is definitely a tri-sector person. Yeah. I mean, he, he had to have all of these interests while he was building his company. Mm -hmm. um, very entrepreneurial. His company was very innovative in lots of ways and it was one of the first even in culture to have the totally open office system. Um, so he cared about input from the people. Not everybody loves open offices, but he was a pioneer. Um, and then he decided to run for mayor. He cared about public sector issues, and um, he actually did some things that were controversial when he was mayor. But he couldn't be mayor anymore. He had already stretched it to three terms but he used his foundation. So he knew how to use the tools of each sector. Mm. Um, he knew how to put his resources into big problems. Climate change is another one that he's worked on. And so this is not a political statement I'm making because I wrote that a while ago, but he's an example of somebody who is a very successful entrepreneur who always had his social impact goals in the back of his mind and said, you know, there are problems to fix, and I can step up and fix them. Well, it's a very inspirational book, Rose Beth, and I really encourage everyone to read it. There are, I, I highlighted so many pages in here, and there's many dog ears because uh, there are lessons in here for people really at every stage and at, uh, who have uh, roles at every level of any uh, organization. So thank you so much again for coming here tonight and uh, bestowing your wisdom. And I'm sure that people will have lots of other questions to ask you in person tonight too. So thank, thank you, you all. Thank you, Tina. Thanks. And thank you for a very enjoyable conversation.